Good morning, church. It is Sunday morning. I kind of like that habit I got into accidentally last week of actually preaching on Sunday. Um, it seems like there's some uh, like biblicalness or normalcy to that. So let's go with that. I'm going to record this early this morning and upload it for you. We do miss you. We love you and we hope that we will be able to safely see you soon. Uh, we are praying and hoping and longing for that day. In the meantime, though, it is the Easter season. This is the season where we focus on life and hope and what God is doing in the world as far as recreating and restoring it. And I want to begin this morning with a text on this third Sunday of Easter from John chapter 20. Uh, this is, we're going to pick up in verse 11, just after uh, the fellas run to the tomb after the ladies have discovered that the tomb was empty and uh, they run in said, yep, it's empty, then they leave. And uh, Mary, in verse 11, is left at the tomb by herself. This is what it says, John 20, starting in verse 11. Mary stood outside near the tomb crying. And as she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb and she saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot, and the angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. And as soon as she said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he said to her. One of the things I really like about John's gospel is how um, he works to incorporate all of these allusions and throwbacks to the Genesis narrative. And so, for instance, he sprinkles these in throughout, but one of the more obvious ones is in John 1, where he begins his gospel, in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God. Of course, Genesis 1, everybody memorizes that first verse of the Bible in Sunday school growing up, right? In the beginning, God. And so almost immediately, John wants us to um, hear these connections between what God was doing in Genesis 1 and what he has Jesus doing in his gospel. He's telling the same sort of story. And this gets particularly clear for John as we get to the end of his gospel. It is um, on day... It is on day... Uh, Five and six that Jesus is arrested it is on the sixth day that Jesus goes to the cross and he dies. And at the end of day six in John's gospel, this is where um, Jesus says it is finished. And then that is when he dies. And of course, in Genesis chapter one, it was at the end of day six, the beginning of day seven, that he looked back after six days, God finished his creation and he said it was very good and then on the seventh day in the creation narrative god rested and in the seventh day the sabbath saturday in john's narrative jesus rests in the grave god rests but it's in the genesis narrative on day eight uh, the next day the day after the sabbath the day after he rests that He's finished all of his work. He's, he's set everything up, and that's what the creation narrative is doing. It's organizing, and it's separating, and it's uh, establishing his creation. He rests on day seven. On day eight, the new creation begins. This is the first day where God has finished everything he's doing, where God has finished all of the work of establishing his creation. And now, after resting on day seven, day eight, the new world begins with everything established. Um, if you want to think about it in terms of moving into a house, you, you guys understand this. When you move into a house, there, there are phases to this. You go into that house and it's empty, it's formless, it's void, as Genesis 1 would say. 
and you begin filling it with things. You begin bringing boxes and furniture in and you place the couch just so and the utilities just so and you put the stuff in this box here and you put the books up on that shelf and you arrange everything the way you want it and you work hard for a period of time. And then usually after that period of time, it's not unusual for you to take a rest. And then you wake up the next morning and everything where it's supposed to be, everything's functional. You've got your pots and your pans here and you've got your laundry over here and you've got everything you need kind of laid out. And you begin your new life in that new space. That's day eight, Sunday, the first day of the next week in the Genesis narrative. God finishes on day six. God rests on day seven. God kicks us into new creation on day eight. And on day eight, it's interesting, it's the gardeners that are representing God. Uh, he creates the gardeners, which would be humans, on day six, of course. He says, I want you to bear my image, that is, I want you to represent me in the world that I have made. Uh, Genesis 2 says it like this, I am placing you in the garden. This is the space that God has made that they are to cultivate and expand to take his presence into all of creation. He says, I am placing you in the garden so that you can till it and so that you can keep it. And so one way of thinking about the human vocation is to say that we are gardeners, those who till and keep what God has made. Now, that vocation of gardening might be a little bigger than we typically think whenever uh, you create anything of any sort, you are, in one way or the other, tilling and keeping God's creation. But gardeners are who we have in day eight, kicking into God's new world. But of course we know in the story that that new creation in Genesis 1 and 2 didn't last for very long. Sin opened the door to death. Death opened the door to scarcity and fear and all sorts of bad stuff. And God's world was bent and broken and destroyed. And throughout John's gospel, Jesus is going head to head with all of that stuff. Jesus is going head to head with the bentness and the brokenness and the darkness and the pain of the world. And all of that comes to a culmination. All of that comes to a climax on uh, the day six, on Friday, when Jesus goes to the cross and Satan brings all of the power of the brokenness of the world to bear on Jesus. And Jesus brings the love of God. And on Friday, it looks for all the world, when he says it is finished, that he means it is finished. I think of another text that we've talked about recently that uh, John the Revelator wrote. And this is in Revelation 5, when he sees the throne room of God and all of these creatures praising God, but on the throne there is God himself in his hand. He has this scroll, and it's sealed with all of these seals. And the scroll represents the unfolding of God's redemptive purposes in history. This is the story of God acting in history. And he asks, um, who is worthy to unfold the scroll, to break the seals and unfold the scroll? Angel announces uh, to the heavens and to the earth and below the earth, to every creature that's ever existed. Who, who is worthy to come take this and, and break the seals and unfold, unfurl God's plans for redemption on the world? In Revelation 5, at first it says that no one was found who was worthy. And so John, the revelator, wept. Because at that point, and I think this is a Good Friday point, it seems like the brokenness won, and the darkness won, and this is just what we're stuck with, the way things are, is simply the way things will always be. And that's a hopeless position, and that's um, really a, a devastating position to be in. Um, but what happens between day six and... In day eight is that God reveals that he is not content with the way things are and he's not content with the brokenness and he will not let the brokenness have the last word but he will keep his promise to fix his world to give us uh, you might say new creation and of course we can call it new creation because that's what the Bible calls it 
uh, Isaiah says we are looking for new heavens and new earth. Peter picks up those themes and says we are waiting for the promise of new heavens and new earth. We talked about that last week. At the end of Revelation 21 says that the new Jerusalem came from the new heaven to the new earth. And so we're waiting for something new. God has promised and God will bring that about. And on day six, he was finished. On day seven, he rested. And on day eight, he ushers in a new creation by revealing to us that death does not have the final say. Death does not have the last word. Death will not rule over our creation forever. It is not the way things are that will have the day, but the day, way things are meant to be. And isn't it interesting when Mary is outside of that empty tomb and she hasn't figured out what's going on yet. She doesn't know what's happening. It says she's weeping. She's trying to put two and two together. She just assumes in the way things are that, that someone has stolen the Lord's body. She turns around and she sees Jesus. And it's not Jesus she sees. She doesn't recognize him. And he asks her, why are you crying? And it says that as she answers him, she assumes that he is a gardener. A gardener, the one who is there to tend and to till and to keep and to make for the flourishing of God's, in this case, new creation. And that's what the resurrection story is about. It is about a return to what God always intended for us, not what we have, not the way things are, not that's just the way the world works, but what, all, what he always intended for us to have. And as he brings what he always intended for us to have into being through Christ, by the way, using us as partners, he's returning to this way in which peace outweighs war in which righteousness overcomes unrighteousness, in which justice takes over injustice, in which healing overcomes all of the pain and the brokenness of the world, in which joy drowns out sorrow. And there at the beginning of all of that is Mary in the garden talking to the gardener that was really Jesus. And so, um, if we take anything from that this week, we want to remember, this is a lesson in remembering, this is nothing new, but we do it every year because we are a people who remembers, it, we want to remember that the way things are is fading away, that it was never good enough for God and it is not good enough for him now and he will never let it have the final say. But he is, even now, cultivating and tilling and bringing into being a new creation where righteousness and justice and peace and flourishing and joy and abundance and healing are the norm. He is bringing that to bear through Jesus Christ. The new creation has begun. Don't just love that text in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Where he says, if any one of you is in Christ, you are a new creature. That's one way of reading the Greek there. Another way experts in Greek tell me is to say that if any one of you is in Christ, then creation is new. And um, then after that, Paul says, because the old has passed away and the new has come. Listen to the verb tense there. He's not saying the old will pass away. He's said the old has passed away. Not the old will or the new will come, but the old or the new rather has already come. This grand project of fixing our world, God has started. He may not be finished yet, but he calls us to join with him in the fixing of the world. How can we do that this morning? How can we be gardeners in God's new creation this morning? Simply be the presence of joy. Be the presence of peace. Be the presence of healing. Be the presence of that's the way the world is supposed to work in the midst of that's the way the world works. These are the sorts of things that make for the healing of the world. And we are God's agents of healing.
So she found the gardener. And she was wrong, of course. It was Jesus. But man, wasn't she right. The one who was ushering in on day eight, the first day of God's new creation, this new world where God's will would eventually and fully hold sway. And so we could join with Isaiah in that wonderful line. We look forward and we long for the day when the knowledge of the glory of God will cover the entire creation as the waters cover the sea. Let me pray for you, and then um, you can pray with me, and I'll let you enjoy your day. Father, we want to ask you for the eyes and the ears and the hearts to see what you're doing in your world. We want to ask you for the courage to follow you in what you're doing in the world. Father, we confess this morning in our belief the resurrection of Jesus, that you have begun new creation. May we be participants in new creation rather than bolstering the old. We come to you now and we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let's remember who we are as we are going out into God's world. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And a second one like it is this, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commands hang all of the law and the prophets. We love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can be seen can't love God who can't be seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. Church, we love you. We miss you. We can't wait to see you. We hope you have a great week. See you later.